few days ago this article was published and it aimed to answer the question, if you stop a GLP-1 treatment, will you gain a significant amount of weight? And the conclusion that the authors came to was that discontinuation of treatment led to weight regain regardless of lifestyle interventions, and that's the important part, and should therefore be considered a chronic, meaning long-term therapy, to prevent weight regain and associated undesirable outcomes related to obesity. Now, understandably, this has been a big topic of conversation on social media, and I've seen people say things like, right, what this means is that if you go on a GLP-1, you change your lifestyle, cut down on your calories, you do loads of exercise, but then later on you stop your medicine, even if you keep everything else going, you're going to regain the weight. And this isn't what it means at all. Now, I understand that people do not want to sit there and read scientific papers, and there's even less incentive to do so when they put it behind a paywall of 16 or $18, which I just paid, and I read the article in full. And it's important you do that, because I do think this conclusion is a little bit misleading. So basically, this paper is a systematic review and meta-analysis. It is not new data. This is not a new study, effectively. This is where we've pulled together everything we already know and we're looking for trends and across the whole population of all this different data. And what the authors found was that there were eight randomised control trials related to this topic, of which five related to Victoza or Saxenda, which is luriglutide, two studies related to azempic wigovi which is semaglutide, and only one study related to tazepatide, which is Munjaro or Zepbound. Now, this Munjaro study is one that I've already done a full video on. I broke down the whole study, how they did it, the outcomes, what I feel this means for people, and actually looking at that study now in the context of everything else, I haven't changed any of my opinions. So I'll link that video up there if you want to see what exactly happened in this study. But what is so interesting about that is that when I read that study, what frustrated me about it was at the end, it showed lots of people regain weight, but it didn't explain why. They weren't looking at people's lifestyle. They weren't looking at if they stayed in a calorie deficit. They weren't looking at if they were exercising. We don't know if people regained the weight because they just had enough and they had had enough of dieting or if they'd started eating more or if they were eating exactly the same but their weight was going up and they didn't know why. We don't know. We actually don't know why people regained the weight. So I thought, how have they gone from this study to the conclusion that we had at the beginning? So then I looked at some of the other studies. I looked at the two semaglutide studies and in both of those studies, none of those things were addressed either. So what does lifestyle interventions actually mean? Well, if you look at all the studies, the participants across the studies at some point received some form of education or dietary input. So some of them sat with nutritionists or dietitians or had somebody explain the World Health Organization diet and exercise guidelines. That's what they mean. Regardless of somebody giving that education, patients gained weight. Not that they did everything right, they did all the lifestyle and they gained weight. And that is a very important distinction. If you follow many people on social media at the moment who are talking about their journeys on these medications and then what happens when they come off them, you will see some people reporting that they are dieting, they are exercising, they're doing everything like they used to and yet they are still gaining weight when they come off the medications. You get other people who say they're doing all those things and they're able to keep the weight off. We're getting very mixed pictures anecdotally. This is a question people want addressing, but I don't think that this paper is actually addressing any of that. It's talking about whether or not having some education at some point, or in one of the studies, they even did some supervised exercise while the participants were on the medication, but nobody's really followed up. Do participants continue doing those things? Are they still maintaining those lifestyle interventions? So it's not really that useful or groundbreaking. And particularly when you consider that people who are going on these medications should have already had education, should have already undertaken diet and tried other things before they've gone on a GLP-1. I don't really see how this conclusion is actually useful at all. Let's go into this a little bit more because when it comes to obesity and weight loss medicines, so many people say it's just like high blood pressure and high blood pressure medication. But actually the way we tackle a disease like obesity versus high blood pressure is very different because with high blood pressure, we don't just go, ah, oh, you have high blood pressure, here's medicine. We actually investigate the underlying cause and we look at the effect on your body. We do tests like bloods, we do an ECG, we uh, do a urine test, etc. We don't do any of that with people who are overweight. We might just check if they're diabetic or not, but that's about it. We're not doing tests to work out why that person is overweight. And yet, if we're thinking about tailoring our interventions correctly for people when there may be a wide range of reasons that people are overweight, generic interventions probably aren't going to work. 
when I used to work as a private GP, I would work with people in a particular industry and they needed to have a certain weight or under. And this wasn't a discriminatory thing. There was safety reasons behind it. But if a patient was over a certain weight, then I wouldn't be able to pass their medical and they wouldn't be able to work. And most of these patients were contractors. So if they couldn't work, they couldn't earn. So it was very important that we manage their weight quickly and appropriately to get them back into work. Working with these patients over the years, it became quite clear there were two groups. There was one group of patients who had gained a lot of weight and to get to this point you would generally have to have a BMI of somewhere 40 plus um, but they would have gained a lot of weight and they wouldn't really care about diet and exercise they'd know what to eat because let's face it most of us know what to eat yes if you're somebody who's aiming for optimum nutrition if you're aiming to compete if you're aiming to have those little edges over other people to be competitive in a sport then diet and coaching and education can be helpful or if you're trying to reduce your weight and you've not done it before again coaching can be helpful but just generally if you're wanting to know what's healthy and what's not most of us know that pizza and chips and fast food isn't great and unprocessed food fruits and veg just know that but some people just don't care <laughs> some people are just not driven or motivated to that now with this group of patients who've become overweight for those reasons i didn't worry about them too much because now that they couldn't work that was generally the biggest motivator and they would come back and they'd have lost the weight and a good number of those a few years later when I then did their next medical in a few years time they'd actually have got really fit because they'd never cared about weight and exercise and things in the past and then they'd had to to get back into work and then that had just snowballed into something they really enjoyed and that was always really rewarding and really nice but then you had this other group of patients who would come in who would be overweight and when you talk to them they were really trying their best they'd already dieted they'd already joined a gym they really cared they'd often seen a nutritional dietitian before they tried everything and they still couldn't reduce their weight and so often those patients would manage somehow to get their weight just under the limit that they could go and work but then when they came back in a few years those were the ones who would really struggle to be able to continue working and it was so hard because it felt like we didn't really get to the crux of why that person was overweight because often it seemed that their driver to eat was just so much bigger than other people's. And that driver to eat can be influenced by over 500 genes. We know genetically there are over 500 genes that influence our driver towards food. It could be influenced by something physiologically, could be influenced by mental health or otherwise. And because we don't clearly differentiate out the different causes of obesity in that way, I never felt like we really helped those patients. Interestingly, I do think a GLP-1 medicine might be helpful to work out some of the reasons that people are overweight. And I do think that these medicines particularly help this group well, but they can help the first group as well. For those who aren't as motivated, having something that suppresses your appetite can be helpful. We don't all have to do everything in life the hardest possible way. There can sometimes be this little bit of infighting, I think, um, amongst the weight loss community of who deserves these medicines more but ultimately if they work for you that's great and if you can find benefit from them that's great as long as you understand the risk versus benefit for you as an individual that's fine but I think these medicines can help a lot of different people with a lot of different problems but they're probably going to help everyone a little bit differently. So overall I think where our focus needs to be when it comes to weight loss is looking at why people are overweight in the first place because when they talk about lifestyle interventions in this systematic review, they are talking about education. And there are a considerable number of people who struggle with their weight, who are already quite educated, who are already very motivated. And so those things aren't gonna work for those people. And we need to have some different tactics to address their weight if we're not going to be using GLP-1s or some of them might not be responding to GLP-1s. So, so that is it for today's video. I'll be back either later this week or next week with the second part of my side effects video, childcare dependent. And then next week, I want to give you a very big update as to where I'm at because there's been a lot of big things that have happened and some big developments. So I'm going to keep my own personal journey quite separate from my more generic videos with just generic information in them. So yeah, if there's any studies or any questions you have, pop them in the comments down below. I'm going to answer a lot of your personal questions about my own experiences in the personal video. Again, keep that nice and separate. So yeah, hope you all are having a great week and I'm gonna go outside because there's a rabbit down there. <laughs>